Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Writer's Workshop. Our topic tonight is Where to Begin, and our instructor tonight is local editor and author Ekta Garg. She'll help us start uh, planning out and writing a short story. Um, and just a reminder, our short story contest is live today. Um, so you'll have from today's date all the way through November to enter a story in the contest. Uh, for more details about the prizes, just visit champagne.org slash writers. And with that said, I'd like to now uh, Welcome back, Ekta Garg. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. As Salem said, my name is Ekta Garg. I am a reviewer, editor, author, and dreamer of stories and books. And tonight we're going to be talking about short stories and more specifically how to start writing one. If novels are the doorway into the lives of our characters, then we could say that short stories are the window into what our characters are going through. The view is a little smaller, but it's no less powerful. Just ask the girl on the train, right? When you're writing a novel, you're giving readers a chance to settle in. They know they're going to form long-term relationships with the people in your book, and they're ready to do so. By the end, readers have seen characters experience significant events in their lives where they change forever. Not all of those moments of change need a novel, though. Not all of them need a full book to examine how a character goes from one life-altering event to another. That's where short stories come in. You don't always need to walk into the home of someone's life. Sometimes just having that window view is enough. Whether you write for yourself as a hobby or you want to be published and read widely, writing short stories is a great way to get better at your craft. A dedicated practice of drafting short stories helps you polish so many of the essentials that writing and publishing teachers keep emphasizing. Things like show don't tell, make every word count, go straight to the heart of the action, keep readers engaged from start to finish. On the more practical side of things, short stories are perfect for readers who want the satisfaction of a good story without spending the hours it takes to read a book. While there are contradicting reports about how much people are reading these days, there's no denying the fact that we have way more options competing for our time. With everything from social media to the news, from streaming platforms to our families, we feel like we're pulled in more directions than ever before. Some people, bookworms like me, and I'm sure like many of you, fight against all of those things to read anyway. But many people are looking for the emotional payoff of a novel without the time investment. They love splashing their feet in the world of fiction. They just don't want to take a deep dive. That's where writing compelling short stories comes in. It's a win-win for the writer and the reader. The reader gets to consume stories in a time frame that fits within their life. And the writer gets to practice the biggest pieces of writing advice in small, manageable bits. An added bonus is that if you blog your stories or send them to online magazines or publish, publish them on a platform like Wattpad, and if you build a following, you'll have an audience ready and waiting for you if you decide you do want to write a whole book. Of course, all of that sounds great in theory. But what if you're having trouble getting started? What if you don't know where to find those ideas for short stories? What if you found a great idea, but you don't know how to proceed? It's actually easier than you think to tackle all of these things. We'll start with how to find ideas for short stories. Some of these might seem obvious. Some of them might seem a little off the wall. The most important thing to remember is that writing is as much about interpretation as anything else. So don't hesitate to take an idea and start playing what should be every writer's favorite game, what if. As you're looking for ideas, there's one key thing to remember. Keep your writer's eye and ear tuned to the world around you. Most people will watch TV or read a news item or observe a situation in real life, digest it, and move on. Writers leave their curiosity on high alert, always. Does that mean you have to drop everything and write a short story right away? Of course not. It does mean, though, that when something in real life or online makes you pause because it trips your imagination, you give yourself the luxury of stopping to make a note of it. As in literally, make a note of it. Keep a notebook handy for, for story ideas. 
Grab a scrap of paper or open your favorite writing app and write a sentence or two to remind yourself of what you heard or saw. This way, you can go back to it later and allow your brain to tease out the possibilities of the ideas in an active, practical way. Writers, by nature, are observers and deep thinkers of the world around them. Train yourself to take notice of things, and before you know it, you'll be inundated with more ideas than you know what to do with. I'll get into more detail on what that means in a moment. Let's start with, start with the most traditional ways to look for short story ideas. If there isn't a scene or character already bugging you for a closer look in a story, an easy place to start for ideas is with writing prompts. Thanks to the internet, there are hundreds of places you can go to find them. There are also dozens of ways that the prompts are positioned, which might seem overwhelming at first, but is actually a gift because you can tailor the prompts to who you are. You can find writing prompts that give you a suggestion or ask a question. You can find prompts that are lines of dialogue. There are genre-specific prompts as well as websites that are random generators and will give you a different prompt every time you click the button. Some writing prompts give you lists of objects or a character and a setting. There are even places to get writing prompts where you're given the first line of a story or the last line of a story and you have to create a piece in relation to those exact lines. It's helpful if you know what kind of writer you are. Do you prefer to write in a specific genre? Then do a Google search for romance writing prompts or mystery writing prompts. Many times, online prompts come from organizations or with writing contests cent centered specifically on the prompts or the genres themselves. Even if you're not ready to enter a contest yet, you can still see what the organization has to offer in terms of the prompts and use them in a story. I've bookmarked several sites myself, and at the end of the talk tonight, I'll share a few places where I like to go for writing prompts. If you're more of a visual person, you can look at pictures or paintings online or in books and get ideas for writing that way. Start with a famous painting, for example, and do a little brainstorming based on what's going on. Are there people? Animals? Does the painting show a dynamic scene? Challenge yourself by not going with the first or even second idea that you come up with. Keep brainstorming ideas until you find one that surprises you and then start building a story around it. Laura Morelli did this with her novel, The Stolen Lady, which is based on Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting, The Mona Lisa. Morelli says that her life was changed forever when she visited Italy as a teenager. That visit sparked a deep interest in art history, which she then developed into a writing career. She focuses on Italian Renaissance paintings in her, in her historical fiction novels. Her book, The Stolen Lady, reimagines the circumstances around the creation of the famous artwork and ties it to the invasion of Paris in World War II by the Nazis. Morelli has written many novels this way, all because she loves art and wants to educate readers about various works through her fiction. Paintings, whether famous or not, aren't the only way you can find inspiration. You can also look at pictures from famous botanical gardens and let your imagination roam free on what might happen in one of those places. See if the location of the garden within a city or a particular state or part of the country or even the world can help you shape part of the story. Ask what kind of people would go to this garden and start the story on the day everything changes for them. During the pandemic, many museums and botanical gardens around the world began allowing people to take virtual tours of their spaces for free. Take advantage of this opportunity to tour a museum or a garden online and keep a notebook handy or your favorite note-taking app open to jot down ideas. Maybe a famous painting or a garden will pique your interest enough to play the what-if game. If you're touring museums online, don't stop at just the paintings. Take a moment to look at the other works of art, like sculptures and exhibits. Children's author Geraldine Elshner wrote a book about the sculpture Little Dancer of 14 Years, the only sculpture that, pa that painter Edgar Degas ever exhibited. In the book, Elshner shares the story of a young girl in Paris who wants to become a famous ballerina and auditions for a special role. Through her dance lessons and increased exposure to the art world, she meets an artist named Mr. D, who wants her to pose for a sculpture. 
The author took Degas' real-life love and respect for ballerinas and folded it into this book for kids that teaches them about important art. The book also stresses the importance of believing in your dreams and cherishing friendships with people who aren't anything like you. You never know what piece of art or artifact or an interesting piece of furniture or anything else might strike you as out of the ordinary. If something does, take a moment to let your brain settle on it. Then make a note of it and come back to that concept when you have time to develop it some more. News items can also spark a story idea. You could take a person's story and play the what-if game with it. What if they made a different choice at a crucial juncture in their lives? What if, instead of going on a crime spree, they turned their talents to curing cancer? Or vice versa? Thriller author Charlie Donnelly did this with his latest book called Those Empty Eyes. He took the real-life murder mystery of child pageant winner John Benet Ramsey and played What If? John Benet Ramsey died in the mid-1990s, long before the internet and social media were such dominant forces. Donnelly started to wonder what would happen if a case like that were to rock the nation today, where every little happening gets blown up online in minutes. In the book, Those Empty Eyes, the main character, Alexandra, is the only survivor of a brutal attack on her family. The police immediately suspect her of being the murderer, and social media starts to circle like a bunch of vultures. Years after the killing of her family, Alexandra becomes a private investigator and is looking into the rape and murder of a student journalist. The case becomes connected to a high-profile businessman who was convicted of trafficking young women and who kills himself in jail. The book ultimately takes a different turn than the real-life stories of John Benet Ramsey and Jeffrey Epstein, but Charlie Donnelly was able to use new stories to form the baseline of his book. Several years ago, I came across a really cool story on Facebook that seemed tailor-made for a great novel or the movies. It's an urban legend and was proven false, but it took a lot of calls to the police to convince people that this had never happened. The short version of the story is this. A parking attendant worked at the Bristol Zoo outside of London for 25 years. This man showed up for work on time every single day and was kind and courteous as he collected parking fees from every single car and bus that came to visit the zoo. One day, he didn't show up for work, and another employee alerted the zoo manager, who then went to the employee records office and discovered that they didn't have the man's contact information. The manager thought it was possible the parking attendant was a city employee instead of a zoo employee and called the city. The city said they had no record of the man either. More than that, it wasn't under their jurisdiction to hire a parking attendant for the zoo. They had never done so. And the zoo realized that this parking attendant was a private citizen who had just shown up one day and started taking money from visitors. When they did a rough calculation based on how much he was charging different types of vehicles, they realized that he walked away with around $7 million. Now this story originally ran in a newspaper in the real life town of Bristol as an example of an April Fool's Day prank, but it kind of backfired. Both the Bristol police and the newspaper said that for years afterward, they kept getting calls about the parking attendant, wanting to know if the story was true, wanting to know if he had ever gotten caught. Maybe the joke was on the newspaper that ran the, the story. Joke or not, this kind of urban legend is just begging a savvy writer to make it into a clever story. Maybe it turns into an Ocean's Eleven kind of heist piece, or maybe it's about a man wanting to get revenge on the, t the owner of the zoo for some reason. No matter what a writer might do with it, stories like this that circulate on social media are excellent writing prompts. Now, all social media outlets have search engines, so just plug in the term writing prompts and you'll see whole accounts dedicated to them. Browse some and start following the ones that look promising. A bonus of social media is that you'll also start noticing other writing-related news and events, which can help you find workshops and classes that you could take in the future.
Now you might not think that what you do on a daily basis is interesting enough for a story, but once you start paying close attention to the things you see and hear in your regular routine, you'll see story potential in them. Here are a couple of examples. British author Lucy Foley went to Paris for a writing trip. At the time, she was working on her book, The Guest List, and she rented a really nice apartment in one of the older buildings in Paris. This place had a lot of old world charm. She says it was one of those places that was really well kept but was, quote, a little dusty around the edges. Under different circumstances, and with an author who writes in a different genre, the building probably would have been perfect for a sweet romance or maybe a coming of age story. Paris is already known as the city of love. It wouldn't have been hard for someone to use the setting and connect it to that idea. Except for two details. The first is that Lucy Foley doesn't write romance. She writes thrillers. The second is that Foley says that every morning and last thing at night, she heard a strange sound from the apartment above her. It sounded like someone was dragging something heavy across the floor, twice a day, every single day she immediately became intrigued. What could the heavy thing be? Who would be pulling it? Why in this old building? And how could the building be connected to something shady? After she finished the guest list, Lucy Foley started writing what eventually became the Paris apartment. In the book, she replica replicated the apartment she stayed in all the way down to the light switches. Lucy Foley never found out what was being dragged across the floor in the flat above hers in Paris, but she used her experience to write her latest domestic thriller. Here's another scenario. I have a post office box for my editing business so that I can direct all mail and payments to that box instead of to my home address. A couple of years ago, I went to the post office on a Sunday to check my box. The business area where you can mail things and buy stamps was closed and no one else was around. As soon as I entered the post office, though, I saw that the door to one of the post office boxes was open. As I got closer, I realized that the open door was two slots above my own. I checked my mail, and then I peeked inside the open box. I saw a letter and a key on top. Now, the boring part of the story is that I collected my mail, I got into my car, and I drove away. But that open post office box stayed with me. How did it get left open? For those of you who have post office boxes, you know that you need a key to get into them. And the way that the key functions, it would be kind of hard to leave it unlocked and walk away without realizing it. But the writer in me knows that if a person is distracted enough or upset enough, then they could very easily do just that. Also, another part of me considered that I could have very easily taken the letter and the key inside and walked away with it. The key went to one of the larger boxes meant for packages. What if I had taken the key, opened the larger box, and walked away with the package? Don't think that because you're a parent or a student or work in an office or anything else that you've got a boring life. The heart of any story is a strong character and the unusual circumstances that they encounter. Take the time to pay attention and you'll get all sorts of ideas. Once you've found a story idea that piques your interest, though, and mulled it over a little bit, it's time to start working on the story itself. But how do we do that? How do we take a fantastic writing prompt or an amazing painting and start writing a great short story? Every writer has a different process. Some of you might like to plot your stories before you begin working on them. Some might want to just sit down at the keyboard or with your notebook and let the ideas flow. I have to confess, I'm kind of a plotter. I don't map out every single scene, but I do like to know the big things ahead of time so that when I'm pantsing part of the writing process, I have a general idea of where I'm going. My writing and my characters still surprise me a lot along the way, even when I know those big things. And depending on how comfortable you feel with it, you don't have to quote unquote plot everything. Even putting down something like John and Susan fight here to stand in for a particular scene is enough. Giving your brain that much of a heads up will automatically redirect your energy, your focus, and your imagination toward making that fight happen when you're ready to write it. Whether you're a plotter or a pantser, I highly encourage you to give yourself the grace of jotting down a couple of notes for your story. If that feels like too much structure, think of it this way. 
When a contractor is building a house, they know the plumbing and electrical work can only go in certain directions, but they have all sorts of leeway on where to put bedrooms and walls. They can let their imaginations run free on paint colors and crown molding. Making those few notes ahead of time gives your story the stability it needs to stand strong so your piece can hold up to any whimsical idea you add to it later. In an issue of Writer's Digest from 1959, novelist and crime fiction writer Donald Westlake offered writers some basic advice for constructing a story that still holds true today. He called it the 5C plot plan. The 5 C's are character, conflict, complication, climax, and conclusion. And this is how he defined each C. The character is basically your protagonist, the conflict is something for the character and, by proxy, the reader to get upset about. The conflict is usually connected to the antagonist in some way, and it's always connected to something that the protagonist wants but can't get at the beginning. Complication is where the character's life goes sideways. The climax is where the opposing forces in conflict are brought together. The conclusion is where the result is known, the conflict is over, the character has either won or lost, and it's basically, basically the resolution of the story. We're talking tonight about how to start short stories, so why don't we take one of the examples I shared earlier and see how we can start a new short story with it based on the five C's. Let's go back to that Sunday afternoon in front of the post office boxes, but let's change up the particulars a bit. Instead of the post office, let's make it the bank of mailboxes outside of an apartment building. In fact, the mailboxes are on the far, far side of the apartment complex. Our character, let's call her Becky, comes to pick up her mail from her box and sees another box above hers unlocked and open. Becky gets her own mail, but she can't resist looking into the open box. She sees a key to one of the big mail slots where people can get packages. Let's assume that Becky retrieves the package and takes it home. And just like that, I've got the crumbs of a story. Of course, to make it work, we have to spend some time on the first C in our list, the character. What kind of person would take someone else's mail? It's a federal offense to steal mail meant for someone else. The person who would do that, though, may not know. Or, even if they did know, they may not care. But why wouldn't they? We need to go back to who our character is and figure out more about her so we can know how she got to this point in her life and also what's going to happen next. So let's go back to the writing prompt, the experience that I had myself, and start with the facts. I went to the post office on a Sunday. Let's say Becky checked her mail later on a Saturday. But why, why that day? Why not on any other day, say, after work? What if she'd planned to check her mail on Friday, but she couldn't? Okay, but why couldn't she? What if something prevented her? What could that be? The mailboxes are within walking distance of her own building. Why would it matter, matter whether she went on Friday at 6.30 in the evening or Sunday at 2 p.m. or on a Wednesday at midnight? We've already decided she checked her mail late on Saturday afternoon. Maybe it was even early evening. Logically, we know there's no physical force stopping Becky from checking her mail at any time. But what about an emotional force to stop her? What might that be? What if, when she left the office on Friday, she was so mad that she went out for a drink straight from the office? After that, she stayed in the bar for some food. By the time she went back to her apartment building, she was still mad, but she was also now too tired to grab her mail. She didn't even think about it. But what would make her so mad that she'd go straight from the office to a bar? For the sake of the exercise, let's go with an easy answer. Becky was in the running for a promotion at, say, her marketing firm, and she didn't get it. Why? Well, maybe her boss told her she was a good employee, but she played it too safe too frequently. The boss wanted to promote someone who could take a leap of faith in order to make the marketing firm grow. Right there, we found a seed that can grow into a pretty dramatic outcome. But it's not enough to have the seed there. We need to dig a little deeper to find out what would bring Becky to the point of stealing someone's mail. An act that, on a normal day, in a rational mood, she'd never undertake. What if Becky has always been a rule follower? You know, a goody two-shoes. She was always the teacher's pet, the kid who sat up in front in class, 
the student who found true joy in how happy her teachers and parents and everyone else was when she brought home straight A's. If anyone needed a dependable person, Becky would be at the top of the list. These are all positive traits, right? But what if this isn't the first time Becky's been passed up for an opportunity to advance in her career because she's so determined to color within the lines? What if she's missed opportunities in her personal life too? What could those be? Maybe she had a failed relationship. Maybe, in fact, the reason why she lives in this town where she's going to commit this crime is that she moved away from a partner after a sad, heart-wrenching breakup. The partner was loving and supportive, but also incredibly impatient with Becky. She had so many opportunities to take a chance on the relationship to help it progress further. Being a rule follower is a good thing, but it can also make a person afraid to take a risk. Her ex was sick and tired of waiting for Becky to trust her heart, to trust in their commitment, and they spent a long, drawn-out evening crying and talking and ultimately deciding they should part ways. That's okay, Becky thinks. I can do something big and bold. I'll move. Yeah, that's it. I'll move to a new town. Yay for Becky! Except that she stays in exactly the same career field and moves to an apartment that looks a lot like her old one. And really, the new town isn't that far from her old one either. In fact, it's in the same state. So has Becky really broken the quote-unquote rules that she set for herself? Not really. Right away, with a few minutes of brainstorming, we've set up not only Becky's personality and the core of who she is, but we've also brought her to the tipping point of an emotional state that will encourage her to make a choice that she would otherwise never have made. Stories aren't just about people, though. Remember the list of five C's? We've got a good start on the first C, which is our character. So why don't we do a little brainstorming on the second C, conflict. Remember, Donald Westlake said the conflict of a story is something for the character and by proxy the reader to get upset about. And one of the easiest ways to upset a character is to bring another person into the mix. So how about this? Becky has a neighbor on her floor who is a little bit of a busybody and a chatterbox. The type of person who has a way of inviting herself inside even before you know she's done it. And she's always asking for help with things. Here's the start of some potentially great conflict. Becky, remember, likes to play by the rules. She'd never force herself into someone's home to chit chat for 20 minutes about The Bachelor or just expect that her neighbors will put up with her constant requests for a few scoops of coffee or dropping her mail key off and expecting other people to pick up her mail for her without even asking whether the other person was busy. Becky would never impose herself on someone's life. Her neighbor does though, and how. And for the last however many months, our play by the book protagonist has been putting up with it. She's been polite and nodded and smiled, even though a small part of her brain has been demanding to know why she doesn't just kick out the neighbor. On any given day, no matter how late she is getting home from work or how tired she is, the manners she's been taught and the way she's been brought up prevents her from saying no to the woman. Of course, that was all before Becky got passed up for the promotion. So let's recap how far the story has gotten. On a Friday evening, after spending the day fuming that she didn't get the new role at work that she wanted, Becky goes to a bar. She doesn't drink too much. She's driving, after all, and her rule-following habits aren't going to disappear that fast. But she does have just enough to make the edges of her anger blur a little bit. Even with the promotion fiasco, she's a little pleased with herself for making the impromptu decision to go out alone. So she decides to stay and have something to eat. The food and alcohol make her sleepy, so she pays her bill and goes home. Let's say that when she gets to her apartment, she sees a sticky note from that neighbor, let's call her Rachel, on her door. Rachel is asking for another favor, although she doesn't mention what it is. She signs a simple R with a smiley face, and Becky rolls her eyes. She has seen that R way too many times since she's moved to town. For once, Becky isn't going to trot down the hall and ask Rachel what she wants. Instead, she pulls the note off the door, crumples it, and goes inside. Within a half hour, she's asleep in bed. The next day, she wakes up late and her head feels fuzzy. Becky, after all, doesn't usually go drinking after work and she's kind of a lightweight. 
The food she ate was greasy, and now she feels like she's got a brick in her stomach. As she's brewing coffee for herself, someone knocks on the door. All of a sudden, Becky remembers the sticky note, and she groans. She looks through the peephole, and yep, sure enough, there's Rachel with a bright, perky smile. Becky feels like bashing her own head against the door, but she doesn't. She opens it. Instead of pulling the door wide enough, though, like she usually would, she opens it just far enough for her to stick her head through and ask Rachel what she wants. As always, Rachel's got a favor to ask, but she just wanted to stop by and see if Becky's okay because she left a note on her door the night before, but Becky never responded, and she always does, and now that Rachel's standing here, she can see clearly that the note is gone, but, well, she doesn't want to assume anything, but she just hopes that nothing happened because it's not like Becky not to get back to her right away. And this is where the heart of the conflict kicks in. Becky's already on edge since the evening before, but Rachel just coming over and assuming all the stuff about her is what tips her over. So she yells at Rachel. Maybe she finally unleashes her feelings, letting Rachel know what she thinks of an overly friendly neighbor who seems to think Becky is her personal assistant. Or, if you want, you can choose a different way to jump into the argument. The point is for Becky and Rachel to have a few minutes of active, back and forth conflict. And when Rachel says something hurtful to end the argument, and Becky slams the door in Rachel's face, that's tension. Because the hurt feelings from the day before come rushing back for Becky. And those feelings bring back all the bad feelings about her breakup, and both the breakup and her job situation, and yes, even the situation with Rachel, underscore for Becky that she doesn't know how to live life outside of the lines. In these sorts of moments, people aren't thinking rationally they're more prone to making hasty decisions. We've built our character and we've given her a conflict that will power her through the next list, through the next C in our list, complication. What if Becky, in a fit of fury, gets dressed and rushes out the door? She doesn't know where she's going exactly, but she knows she needs to get out for a little while. She jumps in her car and leaves the apartment complex. Maybe she goes to a movie or the mall, somewhere to take her mind off of everything. By the time she comes home, she feels a little better, but approaching the apartment complex just reminds her of everything that happened that morning. She slows down because another car is in front of her and she starts to pass the bank of mailboxes. She decides to check her mail and that's when she sees the open mailbox. And because she's gotten mail from it so many times before, she knows that the open box is Rachel's. Before her rational, rule-following side can argue back, she grabs the key inside of Rachel's mailbox and unlocks the larger box. There's a package inside, and Becky doesn't consider what she's doing. She just takes the package and throws it into the back of the car. A tiny piece of her grins in satisfaction. Who says she can't break the rules? Hours later, though, the thought of the package bugs her. What would she do about it? It felt good at the time to take it, but now it worries her. Becky, remember, has always followed the rules. Breaking them makes her question herself, and it even makes her wonder whether she blew the situation out of proportion about the job and her relationship and, well, everything. She's got a good life for the most part, so what if she got passed up for a promotion? She's getting a good salary, has a decent home, and doesn't have any terminal illnesses. There are so many people out there who don't have food on the table. Does she even have a right to complain? Let's say Becky has a crisis of conscience and goes back to try to put the package back in the mailbox, but she can't get the box open. She takes it back to her apartment and wonders what she should do. She considers taking it to Rachel as a peace offering, wonders whether she really wants to eat crow, and her conscience wins out in the end. She goes to Rachel's apartment and knocks on the door, but there's no one there. Now she's stuck with the package and she has to face the fact that, essentially, she stole someone's mail. She may not know it's a federal offense, but she knows that it was wrong. And remember, it's later on Saturday, so let's say the apartment manager's office is closed. She can't drop it off there with the clever excuse that she picked it up on accident. Becky, our rule-following protagonist, starts to panic a little. What does she do now? And whose idiotic idea was it to break the rules in the first place? How is it possible people do this all the time and not feel like they're about to have a breakdown? 
We may not have an answer right now, but we know one thing for sure. Becky's now in a situation that complicates her life. We have two C's left, climax and conclusion. We know something has to lead up to the climax, and you have to make sure that what leads to the climax is connected to an action the protagonist takes. Remember, the most dynamic, memorable characters are active ones. When life situations come up, they don't sit around and wait for something else to resolve those issues. They make decisions. They might make bad ones. They might decide on a course of action that will turn out to be a colossal mistake. But they always have agency, which is the publishing industry's way of saying that characters are active participants in their own lives. That active approach drives great stories. Becky is a rule follower, and every decision she's made up until this weekend has fallen run right in line with that life philosophy. When things don't go her way, like she gets passed up for the promotion, she breaks her routine and goes out for a drink. When Rachel bugs her, she yells at Rachel and slams the door in her face. When she's reminded of the tension between her and Rachel, and really her and her entire life, she steals Rachel's mail. When she, feels bad, when she feels bad about it, she tries to return the package. At every major point in the story, Becky isn't sitting back and waiting for her life to change on its own. She's making decisions and taking action. Then she experiences the reaction to, the, to her actions and makes another decision to act. This is crucial because those decisions, especially the bad ones, are going to lead, lead straight to the climax. You have several options for Becky's action now because she has to figure out what she would do with the package. Does she ever return it to Rachel? Does she hold on to it for a while and then give it back? What if she never does? What if Becky opens the package and keeps what's inside? What if she opens the package and then throws out the contents? What if she tosses the whole thing in the trash without bothering to open it? What if she throws it away, only to find out later that there was something in the package that Rachel really needed? Medication, maybe, or important papers. Or it could be a family heirloom coming to her after the death of a loved one. Even the most active characters are at the mercy of unexpected life events, though. What if Rachel has mysteriously disappeared? What if she's moved out without Becky knowing? What action will Becky take in these cases? What action will she take that leads up to the climax? Does it destroy whatever little friendship she and Rachel might have had? Does it make Becky second, second guess her overall life choices? Does she go back to the office and negotiate that promotion with her boss? Does she turn to a life of crime? The last C is conclusion, and there are many possibilities. Brainstorm some, and stop and write when one surprises you. Don't be afraid to try it out with the story you've set up so far, even if it seems stupid or implausible. Sometimes the best writing comes when you're willing to take a risk. If Becky can take one, so can you. As I said at the start of the workshop tonight, there are hundreds of places to go for writing prompts. Here are three that I visit frequently. Writer's Digest is an established organization in the industry that's been around for about 100 years. They hold a national conference every year and also offer a magazine for writers. Every year they conduct several writing contests and they also post articles on the craft and publishing. And they update their writing prompts pretty frequently. Promptuarium is one that I actually use quite a bit. It offers a variety of prompts, everything from lines of dialogue to types of characters to incorporate into your stories and also pictures from time to time. Many of the prompts lean towards sci-fi or fantasy, but there are also prompts for other genres. There's a deep bank of inspiration here, so spend a little bit of time scrolling through them. You will definitely find one that catches your imagination. Poets and Writers Magazine has had a long history of supporting writers in a variety of genres. Their writing prompt section on their website is called The Time Is Now, where they offer three new prompts a week in three very broad categories, poetry, fiction, and creative nonfiction. You may not feel comfortable writing in all three of these categories, but it's good to exercise your writing muscles once in a while and branch out into something new. And remember, you don't ever have to share your writing with anyone else. 
If you try a different genre and you don't like the results, that's okay. You should still give yourself credit for trying something new and out of your comfort zone in the first place. I mentioned art and paintings earlier as a possible source of writing inspiration. Here's another resource that offers a good start of virtual tours of art and exhibit museums online. This website, called Upgraded Points, has collected information from 75 museums all around the world, as close to us as the Art Institute of Chicago and as far away as the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Some of the, the museums offer actual 360-degree tours of their facilities, and others do more traditional slideshows. Either way, it's a great resource for writing inspiration. Also, there are hundreds of great journals out there that publish short stories. I want to share two that came to my attention in the last year and that I've been enjoying as a reader. If any of you know of any others, that you please feel free to share them afterward. The first line is one of the journals that offers writers the opening line to a story. You have to use the line exactly as it is to write a piece and then submit it for consideration. One thing I really like about this journal is that they don't charge submission fees and they're committed to never doing so. Many journals do charge fees, which helps them keep production costs down, but the first line doesn't, and they also pay if they publish your work. So be sure to take a look at them. In 100, 101 words, the online journal gives writers the challenge of writing an entire story in exactly 101 words, something that's called microfiction. If you ever want to test your ability to use as few words as possible and still write a powerful piece, try writing your own microfiction and then head on over to this site where you can read new work every week from other writers around the world. The site also offers writers the opportunity to sign up for their free authors-only newsletters where you get craft information and contests right to your inbox. The best thing is that submitting to 101 words is absolutely free. Be sure to check out these two outlets for short stories as well as many others. As with writing anything else, the more you read in the genre you want to write, the better you'll get, and the easier it'll be to start writing new short stories for yourself. By taking active steps to search for writing prompts and giving yourself a little bit of structure before you begin writing, you'll help yourself produce some amazing stories in your writing career. So that's all I had for all of you tonight. Thank you so much for coming, and I am more than happy to take any questions you might have now. Yes? I struggle with uh, deciding if what I want to do is fiction or nonfiction? Mm -hmm. how, how best to make that decision? In other words, if I know uh, of an old family incident mm -hmm. of some kind and I think it's worth writing down, mm -hmm. there's a lot of supposition that goes into something that happened in 1847 yeah. or something. Right. Uh, is it fiction or nonfiction? Um, I guess it depends on how much you're bringing to the story itself. The question was if you, you know, if you have a family incident that you want to write about, is it fiction or nonfiction? Um, you know, I would start with the actual incident and see what the facts are there. And if there isn't enough meat in the original story right. um, to, you know, to just flesh it out then that's probably where you are leaning more towards the fiction side because then you're going to add your own details, you're going to kind of brainstorm, um, especially if you are writing something that's you know, historical, you're going to want to make sure you research details of that time period and sometimes doing so can actually lead you to other stories that might be similar or that you might want to explore more and kind of meld with your own. I've been told that technically if you change people's name, mm -hmm. imposing a story on someone who might be offended or something. Obviously, that would be more current. Right. But, um, you know, is that kind of how it works? In other words, if I present a character as, uh, in different terms, 
than the actual person mm -hmm. was? Mm -hmm. Have I now moved over into the fiction? I think you've kind of moved into the gray area in the middle because you can change a person's name, but if you include enough details about that person's they're life or the incident that they're identifiable, it's not really truly fiction. Right. Um, and you know, some people, some authors have said that fiction is the only place where we can really tell the truth. So sometimes it might actually be worth it to start with um, the real life incident and then kind of veer away from it a little bit, or maybe completely, right. but use that kind of as your grounding foundation for yeah. your story. Uh, in, in the things I've tried, I've done so far, mm -hmm. I take the nugget of the story. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then embellish. Yeah, and one of the benefits of that is that then you can really take it and just make it completely your own, and go in you know a direction, um, you know that's completely different. And sometimes rewrite the story the way that you think it should have happened in real life. Right. You know, whether that's if, um, you know, let's say a family member, a dear family member died from an illness, you can rewrite the story where they don't die, you know, so that you can kind of live that what if. Um, and so, you know, that's also something that you could consider. Yeah, make it more interesting than reality. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the other thing, too, is that if we, you know, if we sit down and just kind of look at our regular daily lives day in and day out, you know, you get up, you go to work, you send the kids to school, you shop for groceries. Those things may not be as interesting. But if you do look for those little things that happen that are unusual, that's where the interesting things happen and where, you know, I think the seeds of stories lie. So you can definitely make it more interesting by, you know, adding completely different situations that weren't connected to the first one in the first place and, you know, melding the two and making it a completely new story. So you're welcome. There was one in the back, yes. Yes, I just wanted to know what was the source that you showed us that came right before one of the real stories? I didn't catch that. Um well, let's go the back and see. Line. The first line. Yeah. The first line. Yeah, I can go back to that slide. Yep. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? There's no such thing as a stupid question, I promise. <laughs> no? Questions about anything else for writing? Yeah. I'm not sure what you mean by just storytelling. Short stories. Like, what are you thinking? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely, so I have worked on anthologies. I've worked on novels. I've helped people with short stories. I don't really um, know much about grant writing because I've never had to write a grant myself, and I've never been in a situation where I've been a part of a team that does one. Um, but I do know people who live in that world constantly, so I could always like refer you to someone. Um, have a lot of respect for poets. I dabble in haiku occasionally, but that's pretty much like my experience in poetry. So I wouldn't be like the right resource. Um, but you know, we have so many amazing people, and Jim O'Brien actually is a prolific poet. And um, I thought I saw him out in the hallway, but. Yeah, he's upstairs with Theo Poetry. Oh, okay. They're meeting tonight. Yeah, so he's upstairs right now with you know other poets. Uh, so we have a lot of great writers and people here in the community who are poets and who, you know, do that sort of thing. I'm not one of them, unfortunately. But you know, if I can help, I absolutely will myself. If not, I can always look for people and resources to refer you to, um, so that you can get the help you need. So Thank you. you're welcome. Yes. Um, ways to It does, and you know, brainstorming is is like exercising. The more you do it, the better you get at it. 
which, you know, and, and like, that's like writing in general, right? And sometimes it takes us a little while to kind of get started. And we come up with an idea and we're like, yeah, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere. But the, the trick with brainstorming is that you don't start writing with the first idea you get. Make a note of it, definitely jot it down, but don't start with that one. And I would say not even the second or the third. Just keep trying to come up with ideas. Usually about the fourth or fifth one, you'll come up with something that surprises you. Um, but it's an exercise that you have to do and that you have to just keep trying over and over again. And there are no bad brainstorming ideas. It, it's just a matter of practice. You know, kind of like when you play the piano and you gotta do the scales and sort of like that, so. Other questions about other writing things, publishing things? Happy to answer. Well, I also do have business cards if anybody. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I'd like to ask a question of the group. Is there any writer groups that get together and discuss their stories or each a paragraph or two to bounce off other people and get uh, opinions or inspiration? Is there a group? I am a member of a team group, and what we do is share up to 3,000 words. You're welcome, of course. That's what we're here for, to help each other, right? Anybody else? And I do have business cards if you want them. Come and, you know, chat with me online or, you know, so. Okay. Not actually story related, but no? uh, you, know, you listed a couple of your books up there, and one of them actually looked kind of interesting. What class? Only one? Oh my gosh. I'm injured. They're both my book babies. Well, I mean, you know, elves. I'm so sad. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Certain mood, you'd be reading about elves at Christmas. Yes. Uh, but uh, what platforms are those available on? Or are they only uh, physical? Um, no, I mean, you can get ebooks. Yeah, no, so um, you can get them here at the library. Um, hard copies, you can buy them as ebooks. Pretty much anywhere the ebooks are available, mostly. Um, Amazon, um, yeah. you know, and I know. <laughs> I don't like being locked down with those, but yeah, I can't find it on Kobo. I searched okay. it, but I saw them, so that's why I got okay. Kobo and they were on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm actually in the process of setting up uh, the how to like purchase the ebook on my own author website, but that's not live yet, unfortunately. Um, but if you're interested, like I said, they are here at the library. Do we have the ebook versions, Solemn? I'd have to check. Okay. I doubt it because we use Overdrive, which is based on Kobo, and it didn't ah. pull up, and I just okay. searched that. And it was okay. Library. And I will. Um, Do they have another ebook one? Just Hoopla. Hoopla. I thought Hoopla was your audience. Nope. Okay, today I learned. Well, and I mean, you helped me learn something too. I will check with my publisher and ask about Kobo and see what's going on there. So thank you for letting me know about that. Yeah. I like being able to take my books around with me everything except for on <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, a big thank you to ECTA for leading such a helpful and applicable workshop. Thank you. So just a reminder, we'll be back in this room on Wednesday, September 20th, and the next workshop in the series is still continuing with our short story theme, so it's going to be story elements, description, and dialogue with local author Jeanette Watts. So hope to see you there. Thank you for coming. Thank you.